These guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. Well, good morning. Good Saturday morning, Judd Zolgad. Wow. Good to be here. Good to be here. So so I think the the <laughs> open has has to be changed now eventually, right? To the, these guys either survived Glenn Taylor or maybe A-Rod and Lori. Like it's just become more D- David Kahn is now sort of a pimple on the butt of the wolves compared to what's transpired. What's happening now? Yeah. I know. I, I, it's I, incredible. And I also I know that you've been on Twitter and other places just trying to trying to figure out where does this rank in terms of ownership battles and I mean, the Vikings had a long run of crazy ownership situations we, before we the will save them at some point like a top five outside of this oh god yeah well the group of 10 pe- people forget you know Carl Polat I think at one point thought he was going to buy the Vikings and and sued the group of 10 because a, a group of 10 owned the team at one point so 10 god. people and then that's where Denny Green wrote his book and basically threatened in like the last chapter to sue them yeah. and said, I will take the team over. So there's some Dude. great stuff. Well, let's start the episode by just saying, hey, Timberwolves back in first place. <laughs> get the flag in the Western Conference. There goes my, my button bar crapping out here, too. Just like the Wolves owner. I was going to say, just like the ownerships groups. <laughs> Dude, I had a chance. I went to uh, I went to Falling Knife last night. And it's it just an absolute madhouse of a a Wolves fan vibe there. And it was a freaking blast watching them absolutely destroy the Denver Nuggets. And I know that Nuggets fans are going to be like, well, Jamal Murray, Jamal Murray was out. Well, Carl Anthony Towns has been out for, so, okay, your second best player's out. Timberwolves' second best player's out, or maybe third best player, because I think Rudy Gobert is playing at a ridiculous level. Mm -hmm. And the Wolves jump out to a 20-point lead in the first half. They hang on in the fourth quarter. My God. I mean, Rudy Gobert, 21 points on seven shots. A little rough at the free throw line, but the defense he was playing all night to hold the Nuggets under 100 points. The defense was incredible. I I think the defense, actually, of all the takeaways from what was pretty much a domination, like that's, I don't think that's going too far to say they dominated Denver, which is is impressive because it's on the road as well. But I think the most impressive, impressive thing was the defensive effort. The defensive effort. And I also, so here's a dime store theory for you. I actually think all this crap surrounding the team is going to help the players and the team. And like, I loved the Chris Finch pregame quote. That's way above my pay grade. We're just going to continue to focus. Like what better way to tell your team to focus than to have an example of, Look at what's going on with the, these guys. And to the to to the millionaires that play basketball, these guys are billionaires, right? I I think in some ways this could be a very nice short-term few month rallying point. Well, that's what I was curious to see last night is, you know, they were now all of a sudden these players at shootarounds and post game, at least for for the weekend and once they come back home, they'll be asked about it too, I'm sure. They're going to get asked. They, they were just thrown into a situation now going into the playoffs that they didn't ask for. And and by the way, we will get into bravo to Dane Moore and our guy Kyle Tige for landing A-Rod and Lori. Now, they wound up doing a media tour, but those guys landed A-Rod. They were the first out of the gate, 35 yeah. minutes, gloves completely off. Great stuff. And if you haven't already, I would even recommend, if you haven't consumed that podcast pause this one go listen to that for 35 minutes on dane moore's youtube channel and podcast feed and then come back because we're going to react to everything that was said in that podcast but i was kind of curious like god these poor players now they're just trying to go about their business and fight for the one seed and get to the playoffs and mike conley kind of said it too mike conley came out during shoot around and said well yeah i mean we definitely see it and it's definitely a bizarre situation but then we take a deep breath and go study film and go watch Jokic and try and win. And to come out that way. The other thing, too, is the different ways this team has to win games when they're not playing at their best. So, again, they're down Carl Anthony Towns for weeks here. What are they now? Like, are they 9-3 and three without Cat or something like that? If I would have told you last night, okay, ownership chaos, a nuclear bomb drops on the organization, And they have to go into Denver with first place on the line. And Denver is going to be highly engaged for this game. Mm -hmm. And Judd, Nas Reed is going to go two for 12 from the field. 
Anthony Edwards is going to go 0 for 8 from 3. In fact, Nas Reed and Anthony Edwards are going to go 0 for 13 from 3-point range in this game. Yep. With all of that, what happens in this game? Where on your bingo card would 13-point win that was a 25-point lead going into the fourth quarter, where would that have ran? I mean, it's it legitimately... It, a hundredth? Uh, a very long list of impressive wins this season. This probably is the new biggest and best win of the season for the Wolves. And I think the thing that stood out to me among the performances was Mike Conley, who's been, you know, I, he's been a great presence all season long, uh, but he's definitely been up and down at times as far as, and and I think you could d- debate that he's also a point guard who's smart enough to know if Ant is hot, he's going to get Ant the ball. Yep. So like, this is not a, a slam on Conley, but eight of 12 from the field, five of six from three including at least three early threes that, that sort of set the tone. Eight eight assists, 23 points. The other guy who's, I think, sneakily coming uh, along at a pretty good time, and I think it's a definite fallout of Cat not being there, is Jade McDaniels. Yeah, let's talk about him for a second. 17 points last night, 7 of 10 from the field. But, you know, this is, so I think this is, this current, what we've seen of late Phil I think this is what the franchise saw like as as what Jaden would do I don't think anyone thought oh Jaden McDaniels has a big contract coming up so he's going to take over games but like this per- these performances I think are if you can get these in the playoffs or something close I think you're thrilled if you can get this Jaden McDaniels and then obviously this Gobert and Anthony Edwards etc like they can go to the finals they have a kryptonite nature about the matchup with the Denver Nuggets that should scare the Nuggets. I, if, if I'm ranking the you're teams right. that I think you should be afraid of if you're the Timberwolves, I mean, I, you should have a healthy respect for almost every team that's going to be in the bracket because you could make a case, a very strong case for a lot of different teams in the West. Boy, if you get the best version of the Mavericks, the best version of the Suns, best version of the Lakers or whatever, like there's a lot of teams yeah. that can do damage, but... I, there's just something about the size of the Timberwolves, the versatility of the different defensive matchups. That if I'm Denver, I hope that I hope that it's a one and two seed situation for Wolves Denver, and that they are as far apart in the bracket. If I'm the Wolves, I wouldn't mind seeing Denver in like the second round at this rate. But on on Jaden McDaniels, one thing that was interesting last night because Jamal Murray didn't play, and oftentimes when Jamal Murray is playing, they'll put Jaden McDaniels for his length and size to try and pester Jamal Murray for portions of the game. Well, he was out. So what they did was they put Jaden McDaniels on Michael Porter Jr. for a large chunk. And if you remember the game where the Wolves were without Rudy Gobert and Nas Reed and Carl Anthony Towns last week or a week and a half ago at Target Center, Michael Porter Jr. went off for 26 points. He was 9 of 15 from the field. He knocked down a bunch of three-pointers. And if he didn't put up that performance, it was one of his best games of the season. The Nuggets lose that game at Target Center. So they say, okay, let, let's see how Michael Porter Jr. does with Jaden McDaniels chasing him around all night. Mm-hmm. He only got 10 shot attempts off in 36 minutes because it's hard to get open looks when Jaden McDaniels is guarding you off ball. So you can deploy Jaden McDaniels on ball, off ball, yes. against guards, against forwards, and it's a joy to watch. And you're right. If you're going to get 17 points efficiently and a lockdown defensive performance, they didn't have that chess piece last year because he punched a wall and missed the yep. entire playoff series, right? And that and that is like that screams blueprint for playoff success. Like those type of performances in the playoffs in springtime, like those are absolutely huge. I got a question for for you now. That's uh, it's not really a favorable one. It's a good problem to have, I guess. But what do you think this looks like now when Cat comes back? So, like, as far as yeah. all these pieces we're talking about, it feels like a lot of people with Cat out have sort of fit in into a role. And, you know, the, the last game, the Golden State game, that I did a show with you after, we were singing Nas's praise because Nas was spacing well. And, and Nas has done a lot of good. What do you think this whole thing looks like? You know, plop Cat back in. Let's say it's playoff game one or something. Mm-hmm. Okay, now he's back. What's your thought process there? I wish I had a strong take on this because I, I don't, I think, I I guess I I trust Chris Finch enough. Chris Finch has done such a good job with different injuries and 
and different, you know, last year, the roster wasn't gelling as well when you tried to put Gobert and Cat together, Gobert and Nas, and like, and, and so he's done such a good job getting pieces to gel. But I think my answer is I just trust Chris Finch to, to figure it out. I don't think you can say, even though they've been playing incredibly well without Cat, I don't think you can say that they are better without him, period. I think you I think you can say that they don't miss a beat when Nas Reed is inserted in for 33 minutes instead of 23. Nas Reed fits perfectly. And we went through some of the lineup combinations on I think it was Tuesday's episode of Flagrant Hollows or maybe Thursday. Nas Reed and Rudy Gobert, Nas Reed and Anthony Edwards are the best pairings of any two man pairings on this team. Um so like inserting Nas Reed, you don't lose anything. It's the but it's the depth that you lose out on and the extra shooting and the extra right. offense. So I, I'm as curious as you are, man. Like, how do you bring a unicorn back into the mix here, especially if things are going really well? And like what's the timeline? The playoffs start in a couple of weeks, what like two and a half weeks? Right. That's the thing is it's gonna happen then. Like like that's the thing. You you're not gonna have it doesn't feel like you're gonna have a ramp up week. Yeah. And and I guess my question comes from a place of if the one thing I think we've seen without Towns is a lot of people have found roles that they look really good in and are probably comfortable with. And so it's not just from uh, what, what's your combinations. It's how it's how do guys now go back to previous roles? Like, do you play Nas, Cat, and Gobert together more? I I know Finch talked about that, mm-hmm. but like that that's the thing. It's 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 the it's the tactician question to me. Of like, how do you make this work now? Because it's worked well. And then to what you just said, you're literally going to have to do this as your playoffs start. Yep. And I think what I would keep in mind, too, is before the cat injury, the Wolves were in first place or a half game out sure. in the West. They were yep. they were the best team in the Western Conference with Cat and Nas playing fewer minutes and coming off the bench. Yep. So I, I don't. I would be really nervous if like, boy, they were like sixth in the West and kind of toiling and then he leaves and now they've skyrocketed up the board and how you, there's a, there's at least a proven formula for, Mm -hmm. oh, it works really well. And you're just going to have to reduce some of the Kyle Anderson minutes and you're going to, Nas is not going to play 33 minutes, but yeah, do they play those three guys together more often? Adding a guy as big as cat against a Denver Nuggets team that feasts on teams because of their size can only help you, I think. But at the same time, sure. can you get the composed Carl Anthony Towns that, that we saw for most of the season, right? Like right. we saw a, mo- a, a much more, I feel like, stoic, composed well, uh, version of him. Can he carry that over into the playoffs? And what's his role initially, right? Because, I, I mean, there, there's going to be rust there. And and a meniscus is not a small thing. Like a, a meniscus can take some time. So I guess the question is, if this team is going to to dare I say get to the Western Conference Finals, I'm willing to bet his role will be far bigger in Series Two and then into Three than it will opening night of the playoffs yeah. Round One. Yep, and we're just yeah, and there we're, I mean, we're not it's a great problem to have. Don't get me wrong, I'm not. It is. We're not. And we're not close enough timeline wise. Yeah, they have. I mean, God, they've won four in a row here. So I think so. He went out Portland game. So the Indiana game was the first game without Cat. So they are one, two, three, four. They're they're eight and three without Carl Anthony Towns. And and by the way, they were playing at like an eight and three ish, eight and four ish yeah. pace with Carl Anthony Towns. So they're they're just good, period, because it's an awesome roster. <laughs> and their schedule upcoming here is interesting. So they get the they get a three game homestand here, the Bulls on Sunday, the surging Rockets, the hottest team in the NBA. They won again last night. They've gone from being like 10 games below 500 to now being like two or three games above 500. They've had a nice year. Toronto is a back-to-back Tuesday, Wednesday. Toronto at home. You've got some tough road games coming up, though. The the Like the 5th of April, 7th, you got at Phoenix, at the Lakers, fighting for their play-in positioning and then you have another game at Denver on April 10th but you also mixing games against Washington at home Atlanta at home so the the one seed is very much gettable especially oh, yeah. if you're going to beat Denver in these games you got to keep an eye on Oklahoma City of course yep and the really nice thing about this team is they do take care of business against the teams that they should beat there's not a lot of you know the schedule last season was pockmarked right with 
how'd you lose to Detroit? Oh, you lost to that team again? Yeah. Like the nice thing is, and and to your point, you're right. This team is just good. They, they, they are, have some bad nights, yes, but they have way more good nights than bad nights. And like last night was not some type of fluke. Like you didn't watch that game. That That's what I keep coming back to with how good this roster is. You don't watch them and think, oh, this is a, this is a lot of fun, but it's it, they're not going to re- repeat this. The, these guys are legitimately one of the better teams in this town I've seen in a long time as far as being a complete roster. They can win the championship. This this team can win the NBA championship. I'm not saying they're the favorites. I think I, th- I still right. think the Celtics are probably the favorites, but and the Nuggets once once again, okay, you're going to get into a seven game series. They have done it. They have navigated well, it and they've won the championship, but the Timberwolves can absolutely win the championship this year. The Timberwolves are le- are legitimately as the standing show um a top Western conference team. The issue is the Western conference just has some really damn good teams too. It is. You mentioned just real quick, beating the teams you're supposed to. And last night was a game where you beat a team that maybe you weren't supposed to on the road with all this right. chaos around. So last year, the wolves, they lost 18 games to teams below 500. Yep, this year, good. they've only lost five games to teams below 500. The Nuggets, incredibly, are 24 and 1 against below 500 teams. So that that team always takes care of business. Mm -hmm. But here's the most impressive thing the Wolves have the best record in the Western Conference against above 500 teams. So against the teams that you might not, you're not supposed to beat always. They are 30 and 17. The Nuggets are 27 and 22. The Nuggets are actually feasting more on bad teams and playing a little bit above 500 against the best teams in the NBA. And the Wolves are 30 and 17 against the above 500 teams. The Clippers are 24 and 23 against above 500 teams. The Pelicans are 25 and 21. The Thunder are 29 and 17, just a half game below the Wolves. But that's a sign, man. Like you're just, you're beating the teams that you're supposed to. Oh, and you're beating the teams that are above 500 at a better rate than anyone else in the conference. And the the thing that I do like about the Wolves going into the playoffs to go back to how they played against Denver last night is the defense. Like, I think if defense consistently or shows up, that gives you the best chance because the shooting can come and go at times. You know, there's 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 a level of inconsistency at times to to offense that I think is not avoidable. But if you're always playing defense, you give yourself far more of yes. a chance. And I think when you get into the playoffs, that becomes the most important thing is do you give yourself a chance? Because ultimately, you're probably going to to be playing against uh, teams that are as good a, as you. I don't know that there's I don't know there's a Western Conference team I consider to be better than the Wolves or like clearly above them. Mm-hmm. But I do consider the best teams in the conference to be equals. And so if you're playing, if you're hounding, if you're playing like they did last night, Ant can have a decent game, not a great game, and you can definitely win. Yeah. I mean, God, they just held the Nuggets to 98 points in Denver. Altitude, everything, it's just, it's ridiculous. So uh, that Rudy Gobert block on Jokic in the first half, inject that into all of our veins. so pissed at the refs. Well, yeah, like that, first of all. That was a bad tech. An elbow, t- it, 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 it like he put a little sauce on the flop. Like it, it was a little bit of but a. He flop, was showing but... the contraption he's got for his rib. He's got a right. whole contraption on. He got elbowed. Yes. Do I think that that elbow sent him flying? Probably not. But dude, he literally has. Yeah, he literally has a flak jacket protecting his rib cage right now. He's you look, can't call that. He's in pain too. Like I, I'll say this. He might have flopped, but I, but I buy what he was saying, which is my. Jim Pete did mention this, and I don't know if if he uh, th- this was a couple of games ago. Jim Pete offhanded mentions that it was broken, but I'm not positive that he's sure of that or or was just trying to say when I played I broke my rib. But I mean, I think that I think there's no question. Gobert gets points here for playing through something that would probably confine the two of us, for instance, to a bed and plays at the highest level. I mean, he's, right. he's still playing even banged up like the defensive player of the year, which he will win in a, in a few weeks. So, all right, 
You want to get to the yeah, let's get to the the ownership stuff. Let's here? go from this team could win an <laughs> NBA title to this team is one of the most yeah. dysfunctional teams. Fortunately, has nothing to do with the on the court product. So, all right, A Rod and Lori have punched back. Let's just say, yep. The Sportico article came out first, and then about forty five minutes later, Dane and Kyle, the Dane Moore NBA podcast, which in Dane Dane used to contribute at Score North. He's been a friend. He is excellent at what he does. You should absolutely go subscribe to his YouTube channel and his podcast. But and Kyle Tige, who is part of our flagrant Howl stable, also part of Dane Moore NBA podcast. And so Dane and Kyle wrangle up Alex Rodriguez and Mark Laurie for thirty five minutes of gloves off absolute savaging of Glenn Taylor and to, to Dane and Kyle's credit, they were there to just ask the important questions. And they asked all of the important questions. Do you have the money? Why is this a perception over here? Right. Uh, also credit to our guy, Doogie, man, like Doogie got Glenn Taylor. I think Doogie's the only one that's gotten, well, maybe I guess Glenn and, and Mark and Alex also went on, um, they talked to the athletic and star tribune. So, but like Doogie got Glenn on the record, Yep. A few days ago. And then he gets A-Rod and Lori as well on the KSTP uh, website. So these guys went on a media tour. I'm just going to give you, this is mostly from the Dane and Kyle podcast because credit to those guys. I'm just going to give you some bullet point summary points from what those guys came out saying. And then we can react. And I also did, I spent like two hours yesterday talking to people very plugged in to this entire situation that, I'd like to relay some of that reporting too. Mm -hmm. But I think the main summary is that A-Rod and Lori are not backing down. <laughs> in fact, quite the opposite. They have one of the premier law firms in the entire country. The gloves are completely off. They have decided we are going to cut as deep as we possibly can. That he, hey, that we, we wanted this to be handled privately. The kids didn't need to see the parents fighting. But since... <laughs> Grandpa Taylor came out and decided to make it a public mess, then you know what? We can play that game too. And so to me, listening to those guys talk for 35 minutes, it really feels like Mark and Alex want to end Glenn Taylor. And Alex even said, quote, we will protect the Wolves fan base from Glenn Taylor. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Lori said, we are shocked he would do this to the fans, to the city, to the players, right in the middle of this epic stretch run. Really disappointed. We think it's selfish and disingenuous. Lori referred to Glenn Taylor as not a person of high integrity. A-Rod said he was told by multiple people early in the deal process, like two or three years ago, hey, make sure you have good lawyers and don't trust Glenn. I wonder if KG was one of the people that. Oh God, about. yeah, that I immediately thought that that that's twenty one for sure, right there. A Rod also said Glenn Taylor did not want the Rudy Gobert trade; that he was against the Rudy Gobert trade, but said, "All right, whatever, I won't stand in the way of yep. you guys." That's a great deep cut right there. Yep. A Rod added that Glenn laughed at the notion of pursuing Tim Connolly, and this is A Rod quoting Glenn Taylor. Yep. Why are you wasting your time on Tim Connolly? People like him don't come here. Oh. <laughs> Which, again, we're getting like, this is from, you know, how much do you trust? Right. I, I, by the way, and we'll get to our thoughts on this. Right, right. But if A-Rod is direct quoting Glenn Taylor, that is the core of why I, it's. there's yeah. a million reasons why I can't stand Glenn Taylor as an owner. Yeah. But this bumpkin, small time, rinky dink, why you know, we're just a small town operation. Why would and these guys come in and say, screw that. They called Pat Riley, dude. They called Pat okay. Riley, got turned. They said, We're gonna make Pat Riley turn us down. And then we're gonna go to Tim Connolly after that. Yeah. And what and you know what? In their case, that's exactly what you should do. You are all a member of the National Basketball Association. Right. Like like Glenn, you're not running a minor league team here. Like you are, you are in the NBA. So of all the stuff that I, that you're going through right now, I am inclined to, I could totally see Glenn saying too. that. Like, like Absolutely. that's one, that's one where, cause I do think a lot of it is just spin like, Hey, be on our side. No, be on our side. But that one I could totally see. And the go bear trade thing I could totally see. And a year ago, people would have sided with Glenn. Yeah, dude, Glenn is the most small-time multi-billionaire in the history of the United States. And it, and we've well, seen it for 25 years. 
he pe- people like Glenn owned professional teams in the 60s, in the 70s, the 80s. We look each other in the eye over my wife's lasagna yeah. and we do handshake deals. Like, yeah, oh, exactly. So a few more things from this, just high level stuff here, summary points. Lori said someone from Glenn's camp. Let me back up a second. So obviously Glenn gave the keys to Lori and A-Rod said, you're not majority owners yet, but you will be so you can drive the car before it's yours. And they went out, they hired a general manager, they hired some other people within the organization, they started sprucing up, they they took part of like the media room and turned it into like a private oh, kind of... Not part of it, they took the whole thing. It, it's like a green room basically now yeah. for, you know, It evidently has marble now and nice bathrooms. It, it had <laughs> one, it had, you know, a, a urinal and a toilet before, that, and that was basically it. So evidently, this room is really nice. I'd love to see it again. That's great. And that's fine, because there's still plenty of room for me. You got the media row out yeah. in the arena. You got another, there's a yeah. press conference room. There's plenty of room for idiots like us. So so they've been, whether it's like hiring people or whether it's some minor construction projects in the bowels of Target Center, they've yeah. kind of said, cool, yeah, we're going to spruce up this car. Lori said someone from Glenn's camp approached them a while back and said, hey, you guys need to back off a little bit. Glenn feels like you're doing a little too much. Let Glenn step to the front of the stage for his final months as owner and enjoy this. I have so many questions off of this too. Also, I'll go through a couple more and then we can. <laughs> yeah. So A-Rod and Lori have been frozen. They, they, they said they've been frozen out of the organization the last two days, which there was an internal memo sent out by Glenn Taylor that said no email communication with these guys. We don't want them talking to high-level executives or players. Right. Um, we, we, and by the way, we don't want them traveling to Denver for this game on Friday night. I can tell you, I have confirmed with a couple people within the Wolves organization that that is indeed true, that they are not supposed to talk to Glenn and, or uh, Mark and Alex right now. So just to, just to be clear, they can attend game. Glenn hasn't frozen them out of the arena. What what he's done is said you can't be in that that suite that you built. You can't like have the run of the arena, but you can go to like like he's not trying to ban them from games, correct? I uh, maybe we can double triple check this, but it was strongly insinuated that they do not go to the Denver game last night well how, how about here on sunday for instance i don't when know that to, glenn, i don't know that you can ban i don't think someone ban, from buying a ticket and going to a game i mean i'm i'm sure they have like comp tickets as part of their ownership right. package but yeah courts could seen. they just buy a ticket if let's say glenn pulled those tickets i don't even know if he i'd can like to know this though that, that's actually a good question because like is <laughs> a-, a rod it's, it's gonna be dude. up in the 200s now but they don't want a rod even t- like right now as i have understood it they yeah. don't want alex alex is the one that's going to the most games mark mark is in new york mostly mark was very much part of the media tour yesterday but like i don't think glenn wants alex dapping up anthony edwards during you know pre-game shoot around right or sitting there and I, so I mean dude Alex will for oftentimes for large chunks of the second half Alex will go stand in the tunnel and oh, yeah. you know players will come out at halftime yep so Lori added it was Glenn's idea to do the two and a half year structured payout with the different checkpoints we were willing to do it all up front Lori said and then Arod stressed the importance of keeping the team in Minnesota hey I bought a house here I love yeah, it here, right? That, that did very little for me. Well, A-Rod, okay. I thought A-Rod was doing pretty well. And then he said, I played at Yankee Stadium. Yeah. The I old don't. Yankee Stadium. That's, I don't. And the new one, right? He yeah. played at both or just the new one? I don't remember. Well, he played at both. As a, as a visiting player, he played at. He goes, and Target Center is the best sports atmosphere I've ever been part of. Which, yeah. hey, that makes us feel good. Yeah, but I don't know if I go quite that look, far. <laughs> look, I, I put I put all of this stuff up to to the prism of Norm Green. Who moved the who moved his team? So like I, I put all of this like there are interesting nuggets to take out. And and just to echo what you said, you know, Dane and Kyle did a fantastic job, but they can only ask the questions. Well, and the, and I guess you have to figure out how what percentage of that th- 35 minutes and then everything they said with Doogie and everything they said to the newspapers and right. athletic. What percentage of it is true? 
because if by the way, if it's a, if what they're saying up and down is 100 percent true. Yep. Glenn Taylor, take a hike. But is it is it 60 percent true? Well, is it 70 percent? That's but here's, that's what we have to figure out in the coming weeks. What, what lawyers have to figure out. Here's the question I'd like to ask them, though. OK, so there there are there were there are three incremental steps to the, the purchase as agreed to. There was the first check, which gave them, I think, a 20 percent share. There was the second check, which I think was supposed to be 20 percent, but ended up being 16 percent, if I'm correct. Um, but anyway, long story short, th those were for, as as they talked about, those were for LPs. They were limited partners limited, still. Yeah. So those both got approved. There's a very different step in step three, which is the step that they are trying to force through right now of 40%, because now you are the majority owner of the team. So here's where, here's my question for them and the lawyers. This can all be agreed to, like that's fine. And the two sides can say, yes, we had an agreement. And Glenn can even say, I tried to yank, uh, yank that back. But my question is this, how are they going to handle the league? Because if the league says, you know what, you guys, sorry, the 40%, it's not good. Sorry, we can't do do that. Then Glenn can almost get out of the way completely because it's the league. The league has to The league to would play a bad cop in that situation. Yes, right. but but if the league plays bad cop, I don't know that there is. So so like, let's say it goes to an arbitrator and the arbitrator sides with Mark and, and Alex and says, yes, you know what, that was good. But the league's like, upon further inspection of your funding, we don't like it. So we're not going to approve it. No, yeah. it's Glenn's team again. So that's the yeah. one. That's the one question I have is: you can force Glenn's hand, you can ruin Glenn if you want to try, go for it. But what happens if the last step is the board of governors says, "Sorry, guys, no go." Yeah, no, and and that's all. That's the thing. Like we, we've spent the last 48, 72 hours. Glenn Taylor goes on his media blitz. And then Mark and Alex go on their media blitz and there's a lot of ego and a lot of chest puffing. It's just billionaires versus billionaires. And at the end of the day, it's going to be the NBA and or lawyers that decide who owns this. And I just I want to I want to just color some more of this here. I, I spent a couple hours yesterday afternoon and evening mm -hmm. talking to multiple people who I would I would characterize them as just being very, very plugged in to this entire situation. OK. And I just want to summarize my takeaways from those conversations here. First off. There's an acknowledgement across the board here that Mark and Alex are going to steamroll Glenn Taylor in the PR battle. Fans, rightfully so, do not like Glenn Taylor. I've been personally very vocal. You have been for 10, 15 years on these microphones. Anti-Glenn Taylor, right? Glenn right. has been largely a terrible owner of a professional basketball franchise. And Mark and Alex know this. They're professionally weaponizing this. They have one of the top law firms in the country. I'm assuming they have PR help that is crafting this media wave, right? Um, they are very, very interested in understanding the things that cut the deepest to side with the fans against Glenn Taylor. And it's smart. Like, this this is their way of, of trying to get the fans and the public perception behind them and push back against the New York Post article and some of the things that have come out saying they don't have the money. David Sampson on the Dan Lebetard podcast coming out saying, hey, I dealt with A-Rod with the Marlins attempted purchase. At the end of the day, he didn't have the money, right? So yep. they are, they're pushing back at that and they're pushing back at Glenn Taylor. And it's a very high level professional PR blitz that Glenn Taylor will not be able to match at all whatsoever. Yeah. And won't. So, no, I mean, so that's, so that's, that's kind of my, on the Glenn Taylor side, by the way, I'm told he understood that this was probably going to happen when he put that statement out a couple days ago that like A-Rod was, I mean, how many times in A-Rod's life and career has he been put into a corner and he comes out swinging, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, which is, which is part of what I don't trust. So A-Rod has shown that his PR is to huff and puff and attempt to blow the house down. But once the house is down... What happens? And that's the question. Like, they're going to blow the house down. They're going right. to try to. Right. And are, which they, is, are they then going to own the house? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and to go back to what I said, 
they they are sort of equating to this to well we bought a business and then at the last you know we in fact their example was you know you you buy a house in 2021 at a set rate right and then you live in the house for a while and the price goes up and the person that owned own it comes back and it's like hey i want my money now i want more money because of how much this house has uh gone up in value well yeah that's that's cool that you are right about that that cannot be done but what they didn't bring up was what if there was a third party, which is the league. Like they're they're operating on we bought a business in good faith, and now this putz is saying we can't have it. Okay, that's true in business. Yeah, but there's a third party here that that ultimately controls this franchise. And that's and that's the second thing that I'd like to put out there here, which is just in in my conversations yesterday. There's a very strong feeling that despite A-Rod and Lori coming out swinging in the media yesterday and shredding Glenn Taylor limb from limb in the court of public opinion, there's a very strong feeling among people in the know that the deal still won't go through, that Glenn Taylor will be the owner of the Minnesota Timberwolves at the end of all of this. And so I think the best way I can characterize it is it may feel great for Wolves fans who want Glenn Taylor out that, yes, A-Rod and Laurie, they came punching back. They're swinging for the fences. Here we go. It is very much up in the air whether they will actually own the team at the end of this, despite all of the the bluster and the, you know, the chest puffing. As, as someone put it to me yesterday, mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot of rounds in this fight. So strap in. There might be more information that comes out at some point. There's more. So... Like what's on my end, just like putting my opinion hat back on, following this franchise for years, I am so sick of the Glenn Taylor circus. There's been multiple tours of this circus going back 20 plus years. The Joe Smith under the table part of the circus, the David Kahn part over to the Tom Thibodeau blow up and everything. I mean, like the incompetence, the broken relationships, the embarrassments, all of it. So in a perfect world... I would love A-Rod and Lori to own the team. But I feel like there's 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 so many credible people and publications that have come out from David Sampson with the Marlins over to the New York Post reports to some of the people yep. I have been able to talk to. Yep. There's enough questions and concerns about whether they can get this to the finish line. By the way, through the league, which you brought up, maybe most, most importantly, that I don't know that that's going to happen. Like, it'd be great if those guys had all the funds, all the money, all the liquid to run a team in the luxury tax once they actually purchased the majority stake. But there are, it is just, just because they came out swinging yesterday, unfortunately, it doesn't mean it's a done deal. So we're going to have to let this thing play out. Absolutely. And, you know, the only thing that would have been different is if the league had approved this. If approval was done and then Glenn's like, I really don't want to, then he's screwed, then he's gone. Uh, but just to be clear here, I'm not taking sides because I think the whole thing, I, I think the Lori and especially A-Rod camp, I think Glenn Taylor, I think they have screwed this up beyond belief. Um, the fact that the they dropped some hints. So so just for, first off on Alex, okay? I don't trust a word he says. I don't trust the word he says. He's a he attempts to be, and he's pretty good at it, a PR professional. But everything he, he says, I see through the prism of of his steroid act, which was l- like his playbook. You just I can pick the damn thing up right now, right? Start as a nice guy, but you're sort of awkward. Like 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 his the stories about him came out. You know, he was like I think he showed up at what Jeter's hotel room one, one night at like midnight in a like full suit knocking on the door to talk with some weird story. And then when things go bad, you get real defensive. You get mean, you drop the gloves, you you punch, you punch, you punch. At some point, I fully expect cons- a conciliatory Alex to come back just like he did last time because he's always adjusting to what he thinks might work next. I don't trust that. Lori, I don't know as well, but I did think that there was a very important part. So so with, uh, with um, Dane and Kyle, the gloves are off, right? Gloves are off. Everything. They're staying on. This is on the record. This is on the record. It's like, well, you're on camera, so yes, it's on the record. But did you notice when it came to the New York Post report, Lori glossed over it very quickly and said, we know who that is, but we don't want to say. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. If you're going full disclosure, who who was it? 
J-Lo's camp. Like, and, and the post, that story was written by guys who are pretty plugged in and good. Like the post, yes, the post looks for headlines and politically, some people might love their bent, some people might hate it. But I thought it was very telling that Lori tried to gloss over that report so quickly because that, to me, was the meat of the day. That was independent reporting that wasn't trying to rely on, well, I talked to Glenn, and then I talked yeah. to A-Rod, and then I talked to Lori. That was independent reporting that was very telling, I thought. And Lori tried to dismiss it immediately, and I think he was doing it on behalf of Alex because my guess is is that the leaks are coming from, from something in A-Rod's past. Uh, the other thing that I find to be just very infuriating about this entire thing, and it could only be the freaking Timberwolves, is that a league that is as big as this league, billion dollar, I, I would call it the second most important league in, in this country right now to football, that they allowed a three-part gradual payment plan. Like, first of all, clean that crap up, right? Second of all, I don't care who suggested it. If, if, if Mark and... And Alex had come in and say, we want this thing and we can pay you gradually, but we can't write a check right now, which they're claiming they did not do. If I'm the league, I'm like, no, mm -hmm. if you're going to be a majority partner, you're going to write a check. If I'm the league and Glenn says, I'd like to sell the team and, and, and these guys are in my office right now and they got their checkbook out, then Phil, guess what? I'm saying it's got to be written now. Like we're yeah. not going to do a three part who in, in on God's green earth dealing with Glenn Taylor you know, the king of weird stuff happening the more time it's given, like yes. Garnett. Who thought that this was a advice? This is a, to me, this is a minor league deal. In in retrospect, yeah. and But it's funny because like Mark and Alex kind of, even, even as they were crucifying Glenn yesterday, the one area where they kind of praised him was, you know what? We kind of liked it. We've learned a lot from Glenn the last couple of years. We actually need it. But I mean, think about how, like, like again, that's like Becky's pasta, right? Like, we got to eat at the dad. It was unbelievable. You know? God. Like, this whole thing, this whole thing and everything involving Glenn is minor league. What are yeah. we doing here? Get somebody that can own this team. And my fear long term is this. My fear is at Glenn's age... And what he's doing now, he's going to keep the team. He's going to, unfortunately, pass because we all do. And at that point in time, the Taylor family corp is going to have a team they don't want. And I don't think they're going to have the patience to be like, if you're going to move, if you're going to talk about moving this team, we're, you know, we're not going to talk to you. Yeah. You're going to end up rolling the dice. And there's just so much there. To me, to me as a Wolves fan, if I care about the team, this isn't this isn't so much about like what's currently transpiring. This is far more of uh the succession of how this is going to work now scares me a lot. You know what though, actually if you get a chance for you in the audience, Bill Simmons did the first 20 minutes of his podcast yesterday on this whole situation. And it it kind of turned it was like 5 minutes on Timberwolves and Glenn Taylor and but then it kind of turned into where could all of this be headed and he was talking more from the 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 perspective of yeah it makes sense for Glenn to want to get out of this if if one if those guys either missed a date somewhere along the line and this is nothing I just want to throw this out too mm -hmm. it sounds like they may have either missed a date somewhere along the line or missed a parameter maybe it was supposed to be this level of payment but it was only this but you know what hey we we know what the and Lori kind of alluded to this. We know what the contract says, but you know, when you sit down at someone's house for dinner and you shake hands, you never go back and look at the contract, which to me was kind of an opening. It's almost like he was saying, maybe we missed a checkpoint in there somewhere, right. but here it is like at the end of the, Good at point. the end of the road. But if, but if you're Glenn and you're saying, you know what? I don't really like these guys anymore. I don't really trust these guys anymore. And, uh, I think this franchise could get $3 billion now. So. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to raise a flag and say that they didn't in the end hit the contractual checkpoints needed, right? So what Bill Simmons was saying is you got Seattle and Las Vegas lurking as brand new expansion markets. And the NBA is going to have another massive media deal, media rights deal coming up, so like that's all going to kind of coincide around the same time where here's a big chunk of new media money. And now we have sort of parameters for setting values for expansion franchises. And Bill was projecting that those franchises are going to be a combined eight or nine billion dollars 
So it's going to cost like maybe four or four and a half billion dollars to buy the Las Vegas franchise. Oh, yeah. Uh, and or the Seattle franchise. And that money gets split among the 30 owners. It does not go to the players. So you might wind up with like a $300 million check. That's how hockey works, too. If yep. you're Glenn Taylor. So could you get an extra billion and a half on the value of your franchise and an extra $300 That's million dollar check in the next couple of years if you just nuke this deal? So, Oh, yeah. There, there, there's a lot. God. I don't think there's a good guy here. <laughs> Just, just to be clear, oh, man. I I don't think there's like uh, one side is right guy here. Yeah, I uh, it's hard, man. I'm kind of with you now that I th I hope now that all of this came out and every every billionaire said their piece, right? I hope it goes back to just basketball for a while. I don't know if I can take like a day to day soap opera for now. I want I let's let's reconvene after the season's over and see where this is What's at tomorrow night. Like Bulls six o'clock. If Glenn, if Glenn shows up, people are going to boo him. Glenn always shows up. People are going to boo him. He's, he's going he's gonna to need security over there. I I think it's going to be bad. I expect him. To, I expect Glenn being Glenn. He he comes off as a sort of country Mankato bumpkin, but he's clearly a shark, and he is clearly like like Glenn's Glenn's sweaters don't belie the fact that below <laughs> that sweater there is a heart of stone. There's a cold. There's a Scrooge like heart. I think he shows yeah. up. He has. He will nuke relationships. He will. Yeah. Whether it's a Kevin McHale or a Kevin Garnett or these guys, like he is not afraid. He's kind of a sociopath in that way. I feel like he just doesn't. He's not a culture builder or a relationship builder from well, at least as a basketball. You know what's funny though? Like this is all the reason why he has been such a bad owner because he's a good businessman. Like as far as businesses grow, like like you think about it. Ideally, you grow cultures, right, and stuff. But the dude's a shark, so he's gone in to businesses and Carl Polad did the same thing. You know, you go into businesses and you blow them sky high, you revamp them. People hate you, but it's a business. No, no one really knows about it. Right. But you can't run sports teams that way. I agree completely. But that's what I'm saying is he has tried to run like the Garnett thing. If Garnett was a CEO at his paper company. Yeah. All right. And he'd been a great employee and he was somewhat volatile. Let's be frank about that. But, you know, but they, but he had been one of Glenn's key employees and Glenn alienated them. And now they don't talk. No one really gives a damn. So I'm, I'm with you. That's the thing. But, but we are seeing a play by play of why this guy, when it comes to owning a sports team, it has been so ineffective yeah. because he doesn't understand th that this is not one of your businesses, dude. Like this is uh and, and again, it goes up to the very top. These teams aren't controlled. These teams are controlled by the league. Well, what's here's what's incredible. Well, a couple things on this. All right, it's too bad that all these dudes, all these rich dudes, old Grandpa Glenn Taylor, down to new money Mark Laurie and fresh faced Alex Rodriguez, it was kind of the perfect arrangement for two years. And that Glenn Glenn has more financial. Glenn probably has more money and more financial flexibility than either one of a Rod or Laurie. I mean, a lot of if you believe the reporting, right? A lot of Laurie's net worth is tied up in startups. Right. So it's, it's he's, he doesn't just have like checks that he can write that Glenn Taylor has. And so in the last two years, you've had the grandpa money guy in Glenn Taylor, but you've had the fresh, enthusiastic, culture building, new age, technology guy, players love former it. athlete, right? Connecting with the players. Yep. Okay, so Glenn's going to write the checks and sit there in his little sweaters courtside. But these new guys are the minority owners coming in. They're kind of, they're hiring Tim Connolly. They're building connections with Anthony Edwards. They're bit like they're building a vibe. They're building a culture. <laughs> it was, it's kind of perfect the way that it is, right? Like if these guys were to Sounds just- Sounds like a with, sitcom. <laughs> how is the old owner going to get along with the two new kids who are, well, and, and as, as A-Rod a said like eight times, we're like juniors in high school. And now we're going to senior now year. Senior You're stopping problem. us from yeah. going to senior year. We can't. We, we can, Dude, we Dane Moore with the line of the podcast. We said Glenn's getting senioritis. He doesn't yes. want to leave. Yes. He doesn't want to. Um, so I, I just like if if it could stay this way, which it can't now, obviously, because the relationships are nuked sky high. But you got these guys in. They're basically the Magic Johnson, right? Magic Johnson's never the majority owner, but he comes in and he sits in the suites and he's, yeah. hey, Magic Johnson's a part he's front owner. Front facing, but yeah. But if, if you're to believe what those two guys talked about, and this part I actually do buy, 
where it gets hanky, at least from a perception standpoint, is when somebody told them, hey, back off for a while now. Glenn, Glenn wants to be the front facing. And again, I totally buy that. I totally buy that Glenn, that, that as things got good, Glenn was like, yeah, this is yeah. great. And Glenn would somehow in, in a warped world think that he had a lot to do with, with this when he didn't even know who the GM was. So, yeah. so that that's this whole problem, I think, is like you've got all of these signals crossed, wires crossed, and that's the issue with a two and a half year, you know, ramp oh, up. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, my last couple things on this are just, I don't, I, I have a, pretty healthy skepticism of whether A-Rod and Laurie have the right group and the finances and the structure to pass through all of the legal hurdles they're going to have to here. I would just, if, if you're, if you're a Wolves fan, just, I don't, I don't know that it's a foregone conclusion just Enjoy because the season, they Mark are, pound, they are pounding the table. I don't know that it's, for, but at the same time, I want Glenn Taylor to feel terrible. <laughs> about what he has done here. Is he capable? Not, not just from the press release, but like the whole the whole thing. 20 years, I want Glenn to show up to that game on Sunday. I want him to get booed, and I want him to understand how much fans can't stand him. At the same time, he has also potentially saved the franchise from being moved a couple of times, but he is one of the worst owners in the history of the NBA. Is he capable? Not because he's a terrible guy, but he's a terrible owner. Yeah. Is he Do capable of? Of feeling that. Like this is a guy who has has alienated KG to the point where KG hates his guts. And and you know, say what you will about Kevin. He is the best player in franchise history. Mm -hmm. And until Ant, it wasn't particularly close. Like, do you yeah. think that Glenn is capable of of processing the feelings that you want him I to process? I don't know. But but to your actually to just to the point about like the two and a half year journey here, Glenn is framing it up as like these guys at the end of the day, these guys, this and that. Okay. Well, let's say that that's true. Let's say Glenn is right here. And let's say that these guys didn't have the right structure. Didn't have, didn't hit the deadlines, all that, that they were full of crap. Right. And they are disputing that, but let's say Glenn's right. Well, you know what, dude, at the end of the day, once again, you picked the wrong horse, right? Two yes. and a half years. ago. 100%. Amen. Right? Amen. Everything, everything is self-inflicted with this guy and yeah. this franchise for yes. freaking decades. So yeah, you maybe you're right, but at, but if you want to go back, you picked the wrong horses once again. Yeah, he yes, one hundred percent. And you're and you're basically now saying that. You're basically now saying that. You know, he he is he's a billionaire, and and he can definitely afford this. But just the fact that he is such a small timer in in the world of pro sports too, like this is this. Is frighteningly getting close to, to how the whole North Stars thing felt. Lack of a building, which, by the way, is a huge deal. You know, and then Glenn tells Patrick, oh, well, Target Center is good for a few more years. Because he's small time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, it's not good enough for a few more years. Somebody's got to get working. I don't care how you finance it. Tim Con t I, I, I do believe the Tim Connolly thing that well, he wrote throughout there. Tim, why, why would a guy like that want to work here? Dude, get out of here. If that's and, the if that's the small time mind that you have, then get out of here. But okay, so so enjoy the rest of the season, and hopefully there's a, a long playoff run. But as I was texting with you and Dukes a couple of nights ago, the Conley thing scares me. What does his contract say? Because if his guys are out entirely, he's coming off a year where I mean he's going to be seen as a genius. And if Glenn w walks in and says, oh, "Okay, Tim, you've done a great job. I do like you." What's to stop Tim from saying, you know what? My contract says that if if that sale didn't go through, I'm gone. Tim would not be the architect of this front office and this organization if it wasn't for Alex and Mark. 100%. And Alex and Mark might not have the structure to get the team at the end of the day. Like there's there's room for a lot of oh, yeah. truths truths in here. But but you know? like you said, the two and a half year ramp up which which in itself is ridiculous, it has worked out really well. Be because it proved that Glenn can't run the team. Like we've talked about that for a long time. That's not breaking news, but now you got a two and a half year. It's a wonderful life type of scenario where Glenn got replaced. Basically mm -hmm. one, he decided he didn't like that, which is so ticky tech. But the second one is you think about 
Mark and Alex might be great guys. They might be the worst guys on the face of the earth. But as far as what they were doing with this team, they did a lot right. You can't debate it. Yep. So, wow. That's, I think that's the end of this episode here, this of particular show, just... part of the saga. But, man, it's um, – yeah, I guess one final thing. You said it like maybe 20 minutes ago that – you're not going to pick sides. And that's kind of where I'm at here. I have major issues with Glenn going back years and years. I love the work that A-Rod and Lurie have done so far with this organization, but I have heard from enough people and have enough questions about, like, why is the deal not done? It's been two years. Why is the deal not done? And until those questions are answered, I feel like I'm just going to be sitting here waiting for lawyers and the NBA to pull back the curtain even more and hope that we can have some fun basketball games over the next couple months. It won't be dull. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So, all right. He's Judd. He's the sports dad. I'm Phil. We'll get Kyle back in the mix here in a couple of days. This is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast. Flagrant Howls.